everyone. I'm your host, Joel Bryce, and welcome back to another episode of Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Billy Campbell to discuss the history and current business of a growing waterfowl brand called Dr. Duck. Dr. Duck is the nickname of Billy's business partner, Dennis Luger of Tyler, Texas. Billy shares with me how they turned their reputation of being successful public land duck hunters into online waterfowl product retail, a successful waterfowl hunting podcast, and hosts of Federal Premium's Black Cloud waterfowl hunting show that can be seen on Realtree Outdoors digital platform, Realtree 365. With that introduction, let's bring in today's guest, Billy Campbell. How's it going today? Man, Joe, I'm doing great. Appreciate you letting me jump on today, man. Hey, I appreciate it. You know, I I apologize one more time. It's, it, we've been trying to have this conversation for quite a few months. And so let's see if we can live up to at least my expectation. Well, I hope so. And yes, sir, it's no worries. It's been on both our ends. We, we stay pretty di- busy during duck season. And and uh, it's just one of those deals where, where we, we get the time in when we can. So again, very thankful for you taking time to to let, let, let me share our story with you guys today. Oh man, you're welcome. I, I do appreciate you taking the time and, and we'll catch Dennis, um, a, a, at another opportunity, but, but for our listeners, we want to take this bot, this podcast and introduce, you know, Delta's listeners and members to Dr. Duck. I think, you know, myself, all that, not, not that long ago, I was unfamiliar. I was hearing Dr. Duck, Dr. Duck, what is that? You know, who are they? What is it? And, uh, you know, I, I love your guys' beards, and so when I saw when I saw pictures of you guys on the internet, I'm like, yeah, I, I think we need to learn a little bit about these guys. But but again, Billy Campbell and and Dennis Dennis Luger was he's the other half of Doctor Duck. Actually, he goes by the name Doctor Duck. He wasn't able to join us today. Um, which we'll catch him on another time, but, but I wanted to spend the time, like I said, to, to get an opportunity to know you. And then if you don't mind, you know, once we get to that moment, introduce people to Dennis, his background, but you know, Dr. Duck is three big things to me. It's waterfowl hunting gear and, you know, spend some time on the website. That's drduck.com and you'll find all kinds of pretty hardcore, quality hunting gear which which is pretty exciting and i've seen a few of your pieces floating around here in the office from time to time so it's it's real quality and then we'll talk about the waterfowl podcast that you and dennis do together and then the i guess the real tree sponsored or it's real tree show federal premiums black cloud that's a, a web-based show right yes sir that's right a, a hunting show looks like three seasons so far that's correct yes sir awesome okay well if i didn't and then you know, from what I've learned about you guys, Billy, is that public land, I'm not going to say you don't hunt private land, but I see in a lot of your promotion, a lot of your videos that you guys, you know, you guys do highlight that you are successful hunting a lot of public ground. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I don't want you to give away GPS points or anything like that, but you know what, in, in conversations with you in the past, you guys understand, I guess, you know, the need to introduce new people to hunting. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, are new to hunting, don't have, you know, their own private ground. Maybe they don't want to spend money on a lease or purchase. So, and knocking on doors to get permission might not work in some parts of the country. So to the extent at the end of here that you guys wouldn't mind that you wouldn't mind sharing maybe some tips for a new hunter, you know, what should they be thinking of and, and, and looking at when they're thinking of, of hunting public land, wherever they may be from? Yeah, not at all, Joe. And, and I appreciate you kind of picking up on that. We, we do the majority of our hunting on public ground. And just like you mentioned, we were, we were new hunters at one point and, you know, 30 years ago, close to it. And I'll back up just a little bit to share Dennis and I, we both grew up hunting. We were not friends growing up. He was squirrel. A lot of he had, he worked with dogs very on, very early on with coon dogs and did a lot of coon hunting and varmint hunting. Whereas I did mostly squirrel and deer with my father in Arkansas. I ended up losing my father at an early age. Moved here to East Texas, at which point 
got done with school and that's when a mutual friend of ours introduced me to Dennis and we kind of got back into it together and decided Dennis had decided he wanted to learn to duck hunt. And just like you mentioned, we didn't really have access to finance for, for private grounds and getting permission here in Texas is a little different than it is up in the Midwest. And it's very difficult to get permission here to hunt. And so we cut our teeth essentially and learn the ins and outs of public ground waterfowl hunting here in East Texas. We didn't, we didn't really have anyone in the family or friends at the time that we knew that did it. So we kind of learned a lot of that on our own. And uh, over the years, we, we did, we learned, it took us a long time, just like it does everybody else, but we did find some success and uh, eventually got to a point, a gentleman wanted to share our story. And that that's, we can talk more about that later, but the um, just, us taking that time together, we built a strong relationship, obviously one that's been, we've been lifelong friends now. And, and, you know, when you come home, you, you work all week, you, you come home for the weekend, catch up on your honeydews and maybe you throw the TV on duck hunting shows. And it was, it always seemed like to us that a lot of those duck hunting shows were based on private properties. And when you start duck hunting, you know, the difference. And we always wanted, wouldn't it be neat if at some point, there would be a show that would highlight all the work and the effort that goes in for the public land hunter, the guy who has to get out there and compete about with other guys, right. You know, right on the other side of the hole or from the boat ramp to getting the hole. I mean, it, it's very competitive and we thought it'd always be neat if someone would share that story. And we were blessed with the opportunity several years later to, to do that. And it wasn't without taking some grief, some people were kind of funny about what they would like to see shared about public land hunting. Uh, but we've tried to handle it tactfully. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal is not to give up spots. It's not to, you know, Dennis says it all the time. There aren't really that many secrets anymore in public ground hunting. It's just a matter if you're going to get out there and figure it out. And we try to encourage everybody to figure out on their own that really is kind of the biggest tip. And, and that's something that we do through the po podcast. We just thought it would be great to have a more consistent opportunity for engagement and conversation around public land waterfowl with people who are interested in it. You know, a lot of, a lot of times nowadays you see great content creators who are put into positions, either marketing positions, or they love the outdoors. So they want to mix outdoors with their content creation abilities. Well, while I did have a marketing background, content creation was not something Dennis and I are very good at at all. We just wanted to kill ducks. And uh, our story starts with a, a gentleman out of California who chased us down for several years and wanted to share that success that he could see us having through social media, uh, hunting public waterfowl. And it's, it's not something we were interested in at all. We ran from it. Uh, for multiple years and this guy Ben Potter can outdoors is his name and he he kept on and kept on and and finally Dennis said look maybe we just ought to have him out for a weekend and eventually we offered our place up Ben came out and he did a little short film called Dr. Duck and Dr. Duck was really just a name that me and some other of our hunting buddies at the time called him because we were weekend warriors, if you will. You work all week, you do your thing, you get out and you have some fun and shoot some ducks on the weekend. Dennis took it to another level with us. You wanted to be on the team, you wanted to get out here. We needed to, he wanted to be more successful than people that he was seeing public land waterfowl hunting in our area. So the amount of scouting, the amount of research and homework and time that he spent outside trying to figure out how he could harvest more ducks in a waterfowl season on public land in East Texas. It just, he took it to a new level at that time. And that's, that name just kind of stuck. And uh, Ben did a short film telling our story. And I think we did three of those, three or four of those with Ben before combining up with, with jumping on board with Realtree and uh, very thankful for that opportunity. And then here we are several years down the road with them now doing a regular series that does indeed allow us to show the work 
the successes and the failures that us common folk are going to experience chasing public land mallards. You have to have the, <laughs> you can't just have the, you're not very relatable if you have nothing but success. And so good for you guys to show some of the balance there. But, you know, we, we kind of skipped over, a, a, I guess, the traditional uh, intro, but uh, maybe we can modify this a little bit. Now, both you and Dennis are from from Texas. Is that where you're both from? I was from southwestern Arkansas, but moved here during school. So, yes, they're right around the Tyler Brownsboro area. Dennis grew up in Brownsboro, Texas. Okay. And and I find it interesting that, that you know, you guys – have dedicated your modern day careers now to, to waterfowl, waterfowl hunting, waterfowl media products, but you didn't, you know, it, you, you don't have to go that much that far back where you guys really first came to waterfowl hunting. How, you know, why was it that you guys weren't, what is it about your upbringing that, that why it didn't include it, why it didn't include waterfowl? That's a really good question. You know, a lot of people, when they figure out how it's, raised really through those youth seasons where I got into hunting it was deer and squirrel but it was in Arkansas and it's hard for a lot of folks to believe how in the world did you live in Arkansas and not duck hunt and it's it's just one of those deals that my father was not into and here in East Texas waterfowl hunting is not as big as it is in other areas uh, I like to think that where we're at in East Texas we're we're kind of right we're we're splitting a couple flyways in my opinion you know you got Arkansas obviously is Arkansas and that flyway has always been renowned for the great experiences in the big trees and you drift a, several hours west of us into the in the you know the, the great west Texas southwest Texas prairies there's a lot of agriculture there still here in east Texas you know Dennis likes to tell a story they they raise more cattle grass here than they do anything else so mm -hmm our moist soil units, beaver ponds, and things like that, that we're able to find on public. And, and we just kind of split those two areas. So, so we didn't find that success. And Dennis grew up deer hunting and coon dog hunting and his dad couldn't spend that time with him. So it was his grandfather and his grandfather was really passionate about coon hunting. So that's, that's kind of where Dennis spent his time. And, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know that we've ever had the conversation why ducks. It just, the ability to communicate back and forth with an animal like you do turkey hunting, duck hunting, elk hunting, all three of those have always driven interest with us. Mm -hmm. And it just happens that we want, we tried ducks, found that easiest to do first. And it, to be honest with you, it ended up being a lot more complicated than what we thought it would be going in. And it really absorbed a lot of our time and energy. And like it does with most of us to get into waterfowl hunting, it, creates a very very strong passion to stay after them and if you haven't done it it's probably hard to understand but like you and most people that will listen to this they get it and they know how it draws you in and we just stayed with it <laughs> yeah you know it's my hope that you know delta has a strong hunter recruitment presence you may have heard us you know call it our, our program is called hunter three so it's hunter recruitment retention and reactivation and so what we're trying to do is play our role in increasing the number of hunters that are on that are in North America so we can have a stronger future for hunting, the political relevancy. So hopefully our programs are working and we have some new hunters listening to this podcast and you know it I kind of reflect on I think it's it is interesting that you hunted other forms of game came to waterfowl later on in life and just took to it like crazy, right? I mean, you guys are just ate up with it. For me, as a kid, we hunted everything that we could in West Central Wisconsin, and waterfowl were, you know, that hunting ducks was something that that I was most excited about. And I and and I think as a young hunter, it, it scratches so many itches. You know, you know, you can harvest a bag limit or try, you know, when you're first getting out one day and you can do it again the next day and you can do it again the next day and it's action packed and you can move and talk and laugh and eat, you know, it, it does so many things. And I think when people get older in life, maybe then they're okay sitting in a tree stand for eight hours, shooting one deer and being done with it. And so I think, you know, waterfowling scratches that itch. I think it, from a, from a 10 year old kid, 
to a hundred year old person, you know, I think everybody, there's something to love about waterfowl, no matter where you are in this world. No, no matter how old you are, how, how, I don't know, whatever you're into, you know, I think waterfowling plays a, a lifelong role for everyone. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And I, I think some of that cut in and out, but I got the gist of what you're saying and, and you nailed it. I mean, really for us, you know, growing up, you have all these team sports you're involved in. And as you get older and you have kids and relationships and obviously work that you're very busy with trying to establish yourself professionally and do these things, you, you get away from that recreational team sport. And like you said, with deer hunting, I mean, it's great. And, and, my family spent a lot of time deer hunting to put food on the table. That was a primary source of food for us, but there was just something different about the, the team effort, the enjoyment, the recreational aspect of getting together with a bunch of your buddies and going and chasing ducks. There is, there is. Hey, just one little distract, not distraction, but I, I think that's, so for those, everyone is listening to this podcast, but Billy and I are on zoom so we can see each other and, and if you hear what sounds like a dog scratching at the tags on its collar, that that's true. It's so Billy's dog, Black Lab, in the background every once in a while starts scratching his uh, his or her neck, and you can hear the you can hear the rabies tags that. or all that. Got. No, that's pretty good. I, I my dog is in here too, but uh, I don't have a collar on him, so we don't hear that. But hey, let's let's take a uh, step back here a little bit. So let's focus in on Doctor Duck, the business. Again, we have, you have the waterfowl hunting gear, there's the podcast, and the real tree show called Black Cloud. Which started first? Or how did, you know, which of those three different categories, which happened first? The video content, for sure. Okay, the, so uh, you guys just started, you, you were talking about social media, where you and Dennis would put things out on social media, generated the attention from a gentleman, I believe you said in California, what was the purpose of the social media? Were you guys just doing what most people do and just, just posting and hanging out? Well, we were very early to the Instagram game. I think it came out what 2011 or something like that. We had maybe a little earlier than that, but we, we established our accounts around that season, the 11, 12 season. And like I mentioned, I, I had a, a marketing background and, and in all honesty, memories with waterfowl hunting especially with young kids is a great i mean it's just those memories they last a lifetime but documenting them for us was always a challenge so we would take cameras uh we would lose phones inevitably you got the little cards you put in the camera to keep your pictures on i can't tell you where any of those cards ever end up we were just not technologically we weren't we we weren't able to document those memories like we wanted and for us when instagram came about it was just what i feel like it was intended to be was just a way to show people into what you're doing into your life by documenting those memories so we we started based on that name dr duck that we poked fun at him about i started him a dr duck instagram account and all we did is when we went hunting and we document our hunts and we we hit a lick it's not a huge account but it grew fairly fast early uh we utilized the hashtags at the time and you know there's lots of different angles perspectives and conversation about people and how they utilize social media but at the end of the day we felt like it was a great tool those pictures are still there today mm -hmm. you know we can go back and see those pictures of of us and or the kids and remember the times that we had. So that's all we were trying to do is, is kind of just share through Instagram, some of our memories through public land waterfowl hunting. So did you, when you started that social media presence, were you hoping, was it in the plans to possibly, you know, start a business or was it just, no, sir. just, just average Joe posting on, on social media? That's all it was. And, and, uh, we had, we, in fact, quite the opposite. We were pretty concerned, honestly, when there started, when Ben started reaching out to us and, Hey, I want a video. I want to share this on another level. You're doing some cool stuff. I, I feel like it'd be an interesting story. 
we didn't want to do that. We, Dennis, Dennis is a real simple guy. And, and at the end of the day, Dennis likes, he likes getting after ducks. And he, he, we were a little concerned that at some point, what, what if it turned into a job mm -hmm. and, or, you know, there's just so many different, like I mentioned, angles and perspectives that could come about and be stirred up by that. We wanted to be very cautious and we made it very clear to him and we have a great relationship with Realtree. There's, there's no, there's no button pushing on. I want to see this. We need to see this. It's, it's always remained true to what Dennis wants to accomplish and that's show the work that goes in and the finding and getting the ducks. And uh, that's, so we were quite the opposite. We were not looking for opportunities to grow anything at that time. Uh, we just, we really just, we wanted to share a little insight into our story and we wanted to show that you could find success on public land if you work at it. And that's kind of what we stuck to. Okay. So then Ben, was a, a follower he was seeing what you're posting you you'd mentioned the short film called dr duck right that was the name of it yes sir okay and then so obviously that must have attracted the attention of realtree so if we're going to the to the i guess the online show black cloud is that that's so then re, walk me through that one how did you guys get going on on the realtree show yeah, it's a really good question, Joe. And and we had we had other partners along the way during that journey. And it was it's very interesting. You see a lot of folks joining pro staffs and joining companies from uh, marketing and promotional pers perspectives now. And and for us, we again just wanted really to be true to to sharing the successes that are possible on public land waterfowl hunting and people working together, being respectful of others. That, that was our priority. And along the way, we we had some opportunities as you could, uh, if, you know, imagine when you start getting some attention and attaining some eyeballs through digital content. Uh, we had a lot of companies that reached out and wanted to, to work with us. And we were, not very savvy when it comes to really how those relationships should be set up, how they could work, how each independent part of that relationship could benefit moving forward while continuing to really grow your passion and, and focus on your message. And um, so we, we had multiple partners over a three or four year period as Dennis and I kind of tried to figure out how to navigate that new area for us. Um, and that's when the opportunity hit with Realtree. Um, Realtree is obviously them. They've been a part of the industry in a unique way for a very long time. And it just made sense to us. Uh, they were like-minded people at that company who really wanted to support us sharing our vision. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a good fit for us. And so it wasn't concerned necessarily over the amount of content or the type of content. They just wanted to continue capturing that message and share it through their channel. So it was really a good fit, uh, friends, family in the outdoors and what Realtree has stood for for so many years was a, a blessing and a super fit for us. And, and, uh, they, they helped supply the, the tools that we need to continue to share our journey year in and year out. That, that's pretty interesting, and and, and I, and I will gladly flag for everyone where you can find the show, Realtree three six five. Yeah, so the three six Realtree three six five dot com, and then it was really easy. First time I went and looked, you know, went ended up at that Realtree three six five dot com website. It's real prominent, you know, to find the show Black Cloud with Doctor Duck, and and Billy, I. Yep, your name's in there too. But I told you before the podcast, I think we need to get you, we need to elevate you a little bit, Billy. You know, I think you're a, you're a, you're a quality guy uh, for for the brand and, and fun to talk to. So, but I would jump, I would encourage people to to go look at that. I see three seasons, and the most recent season has twenty episodes. How long are all of these episodes, Billy? Uh, the current ones with Real Tree that. You know, Joe, they vary, but um, anywhere from, shoot, I, seven or eight minutes on a short episode to 
I know we've done some over half an hour. I feel like they could all be a little longer personally, but you know, it, it, they, they everyone's into trying to keep people interested. Uh, it's a it's a fun line to walk on how much background work you put into because there are a lot of people that that want to see ducks still. And uh, to be honest with you, a lot of our focus in our videos has not necessarily been the ducks. Some of those episodes, that, but they're not scripted, so. It's not like we're going in today to see what we're, you know, we, we need to accomplish this. It's we're going hunting again today. We're going on public ground and we're just going to share and let that story kind of evolve however it does for this particular day. And uh, I would think that most of them end up between 12 and 18 minutes probably. So you kind of described kind of a reality hunting show in a sense, you're, you know, you're, you're right, going to get, yes. you're going to get the goods, the bads, the ugly the success or the lack thereof. Hey, that's, that's the funny thing is, Billy, I think we all live in that world. Right. You know, we all live in that world in probably all parts of our life. We have great things. We have not so great things. Um, you know, some days we're successful. Most days, you know, are, are not that way. So good on you guys to be authentic. So you moved from, Okay, so we're moving through the timeline. So there's the show. Where did the podcast come along, or where did the gear, the interest in in uh, promoting gear, where did which one came next? Um, uh, honestly, probably the podcast, or definitely the podcast. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Dennis and I we're we're not real savvy when it comes to a lot of this <laughs> technological stuff, and uh, it was really a demand from people who caught some of our earlier stuff enjoyed the fact that you know, we we're, we're just like anybody else getting after them. We're not any different in any way. We we've had jobs that we've had to hold down and we try and save up our days off and kitchen passes and relationships and the same thing that everybody else does to try and scratch out as many days as you can during that 60 or so days that you get during waterfowl season to spend outside. Uh, during that time early on, there kind of came a call for a more consistent engagement, communication, uh, new folks. We, we hit a lick with a lot of new folks who were plugged into social media. And in all honesty, Dennis and I are pretty old for the social media thing, right? You get a lot of kids on here that grew up with iPhones. I mean, they, they start out with social media accounts. That's not something that we had access to growing up. So it's a younger generation. Duck hunting, I'm sure you'd agree, can tend to be a young man's game. And we get a lot of new guys who want to get into it and they want to learn. They they really do want to learn more about it. How do they do better? How do they treat people? How do they, you know, how are you going to find ducks? And so the podcast was kind of created to help us consistently communicate. And while we have a lot of guests on uh, that we share general information about waterfowl, a lot of our podcasts are just he and I chit chatting about duck hunting and we'll take, questions that we get through social media and through emails or text messages or however they'll come in and we'll kind of use those as topics to help people understand more about how we're successful so the podcast was really put in place just to create another avenue for us to con continue to engage on a consistent basis and it was really during that time that we probably figured out kind of honed in on a mission if you will mm -hmm. Um, anybody who's waterfowl hunted, we mentioned the, the, uh, how it can be competitive sometimes, especially when you get into certain areas, waterfowl hunting, that competitiveness leads to people not being really, truly respectful of one another in the hunting world. And it's seemed to steamroll since we come up with that but Dennis it just kind of made it a priority of his to make sure people understand you can find success while treating others with a high level of respect and you know a lot, I mean a lot of times like when we were 30 years ago when we were cutting our teeth on public ground nobody wanted to help us you know it's not like you run into a guy and he sees you took a tail whooping today you had to paddle your boat back to the ramp because you had motor troubles you didn't kill anything whole bunch of other guys out here killing birds and they, they didn't care. They laugh at you when you get back to the ramp. 
poke fun at you and you go back and you try and do better tomorrow than you did today. Uh, they don't want to share secrets. They don't want to share spots. And, and that's fine. It's, it's not something that has to be shared, but the time mm -hmm. and the opportunities to share with new people is always a blessing. And you never know when you run into a guy who might could provide some great insight for you, or when you can just help provide an opportunity for somebody who's had a tough time getting on birds. So it just, it kind of helped us really hone in on the fact that we, we see this industry drifting in a certain direction. And as much time as we had had under our belt in that industry, then we felt like it would be good for us to just, we need to, we need to talk with a more consistent message of respect. And that's it. You don't have to share your spot, but you also don't have to set up, shoot people's swings and be a turd while we're out there. We, you know, and that's, that's probably what kind of, like I said, it kind of, we were able to hone that in and utilize the podcast to go down that road. And in all honesty, I know we're not, we're talking Dr. Duck, but that's, one of the things, obviously, we have a good partnership with Delta, and you guys, R3 program, we felt was just so brilliant and, and something that we were so interested in, especially the last few years. If you look at our world and some of the crazy things that are happening, everybody who has anything to do with hunting or spend any time hunting, they'll tell you how little a world that really is in comparison to everything else. And you know, in that little world, if we can't learn to be on the same team and treat each other with a, a high level of respect and help each other be successful, it really doesn't say much for us outside of that little world. And I think it's now more important than ever uh, that, that we just understand that we're all on the same team. Uh, Dennis understands the importance of that. And that that's kind of you know, the, the recruitment aspect of bringing people here, the retention aspect, I mean, it, it all just kind of works together and people will, will not hesitate to tell you how I think they, that crowded public areas are, but in reality, we have a lot more room for new hunters. And if we're not growing this self-funded industry by ourselves, there's, there's nobody else going to step in and do it for us. No, I, <laughs> we could talk for, <clears throat> hours about the stuff that you just brought up there and you know it, it it caring about the future of hunting is is a selfless act because what it means is if you're going to invite someone to hunt invite someone to buy a license you're going to teach someone to do something you are possibly going to inflict a little pain on yourself there's someone else another group of people that might be at the boat ramp they might be knocking on a door. They might be trying to do what you're doing. So you might be creating yourself a little competition, but the future of hunting is uncertain. So as much as, as, as important as hunting has been for you, Billy, and for Dennis and myself, you know, it, it, that we should use that as motivation to introduce other people to hunting. And what, what, I, what I worry about, Billy, is that, and I'll say this, and I could back it up a lot of different ways, is the future of hunting future license buyers that's going to come from people who don't currently have a background in hunting because hunters are declining so that means if we want to maintain our populations we have to find people who have no hunting background and bring them in so if we if we have the image of being uh of not being welcoming of being elitist or or, or secret or we don't help each other out those people aren't going to want to come in they're going to say, why would I want to join those people? Hunters are living up to that stereotype. So we need to break that down. And, and so I love what you guys are doing. And to, for people to find your podcast, go to drduck.com. And again, it's really easy on the top. You can find podcast. And if you scroll through a lot of the recordings that you guys have, yeah, there's product-oriented, gear-oriented um, podcast episodes. There's you know, talking about hunts and things like that, but you guys do a nice job of sprinkling in education, why we're doing it, the conservation side, the hunting side. You guys had me on a year or two ago, and I think we talked about hunter recruitment, maybe this very same subject, I believe. But uh, I would encourage people to, to give a, a listen, whether you want to learn something or you just want to be entertained. So I think you guys do a real nice job on that one. 
Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so important and you nailed it. And when they see, you can just look at social media and all the back and forth that can go on people beating each other up. I, there's, you know, my opinion is no place for it, but it happens. And if people who aren't actively hunting or enjoying time in the outdoors see that, it, I'm with you. It's it doesn't look very welcoming. No, it, it doesn't at all. And I I have this theory, this concept, Billy, and and I'm going to try to relate it to hunting. I would say that I have this thing. It's called the uh, the cold factor. The the farther north someone lives, the nicer they are, because picture driving across North Dakota and it's 40 below zero and your car breaks down. Someone in North Dakota is going to stop and help you out because they can picture themselves in that same situation. Now, the further south you go where it's warmer and you, and you leave the cold, if you broke down on the side of the road, I think people are, I'm not going to say people are nice, but that same need, right? You could walk to the gas station all on your own. But so I, I have that theory that kind of applies to hunting. So I, I do think that we need to live our life like like it's forty below and we're broken down on the side of the road. We'd want to help people the way we'd want them to help us. And so hunters need it. to be nice. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> but it is kind of funny. I've lived my whole life in the north, and I've always been where there's snow and cold and ice. And yeah, I tell you what, you know, if someone's broke down the side of the road, I help them out. And, and vice versa. And, and it is, I think it's a good rule of thumb to live, live your life and, and hunters. Yeah. You, you've got to teach other people how to do this, introduce other people. So if you want to hunt the rest of your life, if you want your children and your grandchildren to keep hunting, you need to bring other people in, be nice. And I was just introduced to this concept. I think they called it the bro complex or bro, bro something, but it was the idea that new hunters are shy about telling people about their experiences online saying hey i'm an, i'm new to hunting and i went out hunting and i did this because they're afraid of of skilled hunters embarrassing them or saying things they did something stupid or they wore something that that didn't look good or they didn't blow on their duck call the right way and so we need to create a world where new hunters feel uh comfortable free to go out there and, and post of their experiences and try to attract other people. I love that you guys, um, you guys would be low on the bro factor. You're very accommodating. Well, we, you know, for us at the end of the day, I, I'm, I, I do think we still have a lot of folks with some quote unquote Southern hospitality, but I do like your perspective of the cold factor. And I agree with you. If everybody treated everybody like that situation, it would be a lot more helpful. Um, for us, we have just learned over the years that, you know, it's a lot more fun to share that experience and tell somebody about it later. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, and, you know, we had, we had our first two episodes of the season. Once we got back in the South this year, I thought were really great summaries of, of the way we like to handle those situations. We, we ran into a guy who had boat trouble. He was by himself and we ended up inviting him. And then we ran into some folks from Florida. They were hunting Arkansas timber for the first time. And they were, they had a spot picked out, but based on our research, it probably wasn't an area they wanted to be in with the water levels we had currently. So we ended up inviting them to hunt with us as well. We ended up with 23 people on opening morning. Now, some of those was planned to be there, but the majority of them really, we didn't know before that day or the day before. We got the hole we wanted and we shot 23 man limit of green. It was a really great experience. And to be honest with you, some of the footage I really enjoyed. The very next hunt, the very next day, we got beat to the hole. We actually got beat to like three holes. We had a terrible morning, nothing came together. We ended up hunting and picking up with some other folks who had also gotten beat to the hole. And we ended up going to an area we had scouted, but didn't think it had enough water in it. And to be honest with you, Joe, we didn't think we would shoot a duck when we got in here, but it's just one of those deals where this is where we ended up. 
it's getting close to shooting light. We got to get set up. We got to get in there. And we had a fantastic morning and uh, it was the mud hole episode. But the, the only point there was the majority of the people that we shared that weekend with, it was, it was unintended. It was not planned. And it's just something that organically happened over the course of one day we had the spot we wanted and we could help some people out the second day. Nobody had a spot, and but we knew of a spot, and maybe we can help out. At least we had somewhere to go get set up. And good Lord blessed us that morning. We shot another 40-something mallards, I think, that day. But it just sharing those types of situations and scenarios where nobody thought we were going to do any good, and we, we did good, and it turned out to be one of those days. It's so much more fun sharing that experience with others than trying to go back and tell them about it later. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I guess a couple other things stick out there. And it, it, I mean, I think people need to pick their own personal motivation. But, you know, I'd bet that if you guys broke down, you, you know, if your motor broke down a mile or two from the landing and someone came by, you know, living your life that way, Billy, I bet you someone is going to help you back to the to the ramp. Or you invited people to, to a spot because they were in need. I bet you've received a number of invites as a result of that. That's right. And it's just gets back to shit, you know, utilizing that respect factor, man, just treating everybody like, like you want to be treated. It's a pretty simple thing to do. And sometimes I know that we get forgetful and don't always make that a priority, especially when we have so many other things going on in our life. But, but it's something that's worked well for us. And it's something that kudos to Dennis. I mean, Dennis is, Dennis is just as competitive as the next guy, man. He, you know, he wants to do well, but more importantly, he wants to do things the right way. And he wants to share that experience. You know, we're on the other side of the hill, man. We, uh, we way down the road. We, (laughs) we want to share what we got left with, with whoever we can. And, and Dennis has stayed really true to that. And, uh, it's, it's been a great journey for us both. Well, that's a good that's a good way to live, and I I'm I'm really pleased. I don't know if that's the right word, but but it's very heartwarming to hear of of your perspective and Dennis's perspective. Just real fast before we move off of the show, you know, you're from East Texas or live in East Texas. You're from Arkansas. You've you've you told a story about Texas. You told one about Arkansas. Where else do you guys hunt? What's your kind of geographically? Where else do you guys go? Yeah, it used to be primarily here. That's it. And we learned over time, as, as you well know, you know, we, we, we just had to keep moving further north if we wanted to have success with mallards earlier in the year. So, you know, we, we, over the course of years, we'd save up money and we'd freelance in Canada and freelance in the Dakotas and over making those trips and through producing content in those areas, we built some relationships and those are people that we try and go back and visit with. And, you know, we've met some great friends that let us crash on their couch, but uh, we'll hunt as many as nine States in a year. Uh, I think it was only seven last year, but I don't think there's really any limit now on where we want to get to. We, it's just, uh, it's all about that journey and the experience. And uh, we'll start as early as we can up north and just kind of work our way south as those seasons open up. And I always try to be back here around home for the openers. Uh, our openers here between Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma all stagger. So in most years, we can catch all three of those openers. And as you're well aware, opening weekend, whether it's early or not, you still have a pretty good group of ducks that stack up. Mm -hmm. The early migrators that come in and and local birds that stack up and, you know, what have you. So uh, it it can be fruitful if you do your homework, even in these southern states early in the season. So we always try to get back down here for those openers, and then we'll drift back up. Pacific Northwest. We do take a private trip up that area every year. This year, a couple of years ago, we did early goose uh, there in New York. 
And black ducks is not something we see a lot of. So we're, we're trying to work it out this year. We kind of have a little East coast swing and uh, would like to experience kind of some Creek side black duck hunting. Feel like that'd be a good time there on the, in the Atlantic. So that, that might be something we try and get done this season. Well, that sounds like a good one. That definitely does. So well, it's good to get around and sample. I mean, I, the, I guess the, the more, the, the more years I hunt, the more different places I hunt, it's just the, the variety and different approaches. It's, I guess that's one of the attractions to waterfowl hunting too, is no two days are ever going to be the same. No two locations will ever be the same. But I guess the other part that amazes me too, is that, you know, there's so many parts of the world that are at least the United States and Canada that other than temperature and things that bite you look identical. You know, I grew up in West central Wisconsin. I remember the first time I, I landed into the Dallas Fort Worth area and I thought, this looks just like Wisconsin. It's just hotter. You know, you have lots of trees and lots of water. And, and so I think that's interesting. But yeah, go. it's fun to sample it all. And I would encourage everybody, you know, to make this really long checklist and, and get going on it. So the Dr. Duck website, the gear, I did learn that this is a, it's a relatively new part of the Dr. Duck brand. And that's gear, clothing, started in 2019. Tell me a little bit about that. So with a lot of these relationship opportunities that have come about, we've, we've kind of figured out, I mean, we've, we've spent just like you and a lot of guys who spent a lot of their lives outdoors. Uh, you know, we've kind of figured out over the years, things we like and don't like as far as gear goes. And, and, uh, and when I say gear, we, we've got backpacks, of course, had some t-shirts for branding stuff, but, Really, we've got some new jackets. We've been testing some other products for several years. All, there's a lot of testing that goes into all of this stuff. We want, you know, we, we always, the, the public land guy is kind of our first mindset, you know. And when I say that, I mean, we have the utmost respect for people that own their own property or spend time on private. We, we understand very clearly the amount of work that goes into that, but it's, it's a different kind of work. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a work that, that we've been blessed with as far as public land hunting. Our work comes from scouting and spending many hours outside trying to make sure you, you have success. So we tend to, I think all waterfowlers in general are pretty tough on gear. Mm -hmm. You'd probably agree with that. Oh yeah. Uh, I think the elements obviously are contributors to, you know, we have some, less than desirable elements. Of course, unless you're passionate about waterfowl hunting, then those seem to be some of your more favorite <laughs> That's right. times to get out and chase them. But we just want rugged, efficient gear. And we, we were blessed with, with opportunities to try lots of different stuff over the years. And, and obviously, we, like all duck hunters, we probably spend a little too much money on things we think we need to ensure that success. But it's helped us kind of cultivate a perspective on creating, you know, like our new journey bag. It's a, it's a, it's a backpack. We're into backpacks. We like carrying backpacks. It frees up our hands to do other things. I mean, it's a lot of people envision driving a boat into the duck hole. That's not always the case. More times than not, you're going to drive a duck, you're going to drive a duck boat to a certain spot. We're going to jump out. We're going to have a long haul in to get to where we think those ducks want to be. So the gear that, that we've come up with and are promoting and selling on that website really, really is kind of years of cultivating that mindset into a specific type of product. So the new bag is completely waterproof. It, it uses the fancy waterproof zippers, yet it's got an organized shelving system in it. And, and again, it just gets back to wanting a usable product that ends up being very durable and can last and hang quite frankly just hang with the public land duck hunter that is interesting i never really thought about that you know i've grown up hunting both public and and private but i guess one of the things that my public public land hunts have more in common than my private land hunts is that i have to go into my public land hunts i leave the truck and I'm 100% self-sufficient. There is, right. There's nothing stashed out there. There's not a blind. I am literally carrying, walking, canoeing, everything with me. 
And so that, I guess that you would design a public land product maybe with a few different features than, than your typical private land. You know, I, I think especially in the southern scenario, you have the ability to stash things in permanent blinds and, and drive your ATV out into a blind or things like that. But yeah, you, right. you don't have that in your typical public land scenario. And one isn't better than the other. It's just for nope. those that only have one opportunity in front of them, it's nice to have some gear that can free up those hands because you're right. You can only carry so much. Yeah, it's it, you. I appreciate you putting it into terms like that. That is completely accurate. And and no, we wouldn't say at any point that one is better. As you mentioned earlier, the experiences, the variety of those experiences are all great. You just need to get outside. But, you know, we, we may hunt. If we're putting in if some public land spots. You have to dock out at 2 a.m. You can't go past point A until 4 a.m. Obviously, you got legal shooting light. You got to be off the water at noon, and at some point, you got to find ducks to shoot the next day. So, you know, when we utilize those three, four day weekends of getting out and chasing birds, it's it's not jump in the blind, shoot them, go have lunch, go jump in the blind again tomorrow. You're spending in most situations, Dennis and I will spend a great deal of absolutely every day we're on the road out trying to find birds. So that self-sufficient comment you made, I mean, we're, you know, we, we, I have everything in my backpack from charging blocks to hammocks to snacks. I mean, I, I need to make sure that if I'm out there for a day or two, or we may camp, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just how it is. We want to, we want a bag that, we'll be able to jam everything in. We ain't got to worry about stuff getting wet and that we want that bag to last. So, um, yeah, that's kind of been, and it did happen just recently, really, but just all those years of doing what we do. And, you know, there's another side of that for me too. I, we talk about relationships all the time. And for me personally, if I've got a friend in the industry and or someone that I know spends time puts in the hard work and they create gear with that in mind if I'm going to buy a piece of gear at the end of the day I would rather support someone like that mm -hmm. and it seems to me like a lot of companies at some point or another there's just there's so many companies you could buy stuff from I personally prefer to buy stuff from some of the guys that I know are doing things the way I do them Mm -hmm. you know and and at the end of the day there is part of that for us we 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 want to continue to share and promote our story that that we're we're just like you we're out here working as hard as we can to try and find success on public land just like you do and and uh, i hope that that carries some water for some folks when they get ready to make that next investment and that they would buy a product such as that from like-minded individuals so uh, we're, we're putting the work into them. They're very quality products. Uh, a lot of that Dennis handles with Rusa outdoors with a lot, a lot of folks that are a little bit smarter than I am about that quality of, of stuff that goes into that. But, uh, but that is something that we're trying to do. It's good to be humble, Billy. <laughs> 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 no, I, and I would recommend, you know, so I think if you're listening to this podcast and you live in or near a community where Delta Waterfowl has a banquet that'll be held throughout the next year, I believe they'll be able to get their hands on some Dr. Duck products, right? At our, at our yes, banquet sir. system this year. Yes, sir. We've, we've been very thankful for the relationship with, that we've been able to build with you guys. And, and obviously again, talking about the R3, the recruitment and retention stuff that you guys do. And it just, just your, consistent contribution to conservation we we understand that again it's it's us as a group that's going to continue to move this sport forward and make sure it's here for others down the road and and we understand the important part that you guys play in that and and we're very thankful again for the opportunity to be partners with you guys there and and that is indeed the case uh some of your banquets and the giveaways and the raffles that, that you'll see down the road and some this year. Uh, we like to share time at some of those events when we can. Uh, 
Um, we like to go just hang out. We get suckered into speaking. I got to admit, we're not the greatest speakers, but it's always a good time getting out to shake hands with some of these folks and share those products through your events. Yes, sir. That'll be great. And then I believe you guys are coming to our expo at the end of oh, July. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So do, are there any photo ops with you guys? You know, you got it. This is talking. Yeah, this got to be talked about all the time. You guys, (laughs) did you guys coordinate the beard, or did you meet each other with 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 beards? You know, I couldn't grow one because of work. They eventually, I worked myself into a management role, and they would let it slide from November to January. So no, no shave November took huge meaning with me. So I would grow it as much as I could from November to January, and then. I'm telling you, at the end of January, a lot of my coworkers, you'd see them carrying scissors and razors in their back pocket, just ready for that end of January. But uh, as I moved into more of a role uh, trying to help Dennis be more successful with some of his business side of the endeavors, uh, we were, I was able to keep it. And it, you know, it's just, I don't know, it definitely provides another blanket for you in the colder, colder months. Yeah, I have beard envy. I can't grow a beard, you know, or when I grow one, it's not very good. But, you know, living in the cold, I don't like my lower back to get cold, and I don't like my neck to get cold. So I think if right. I could grow a beard like you, at least the front of my neck would be would be really warm. Well, I'm not getting very good at keeping it the same color anymore. De- you know, everybody gives me a hard time because I, I end up coloring it. Dennis, Dennis doesn't like getting busted. Concealment's key, and... <laughs> Doesn't do you no good to throw a bunch of real tree on if you're sporting a Santa Claus beard, he says. So I end up coloring it during duck season now so I look more like a tree and and I tend this time of year just to let it go. And and I, I do. I could probably pick up a part-time gig as Santa Claus at some of our local malls if I got into a pickle. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, hey, it, if you're listening to this, come to the Expo, Little Rock, Arkansas, end of July. Get your picture taken with Dennis and, and Billy. Yeah, we're actually, Joe, we're, uh, I just had communication. In fact, if you heard that little bell on my phone going off a little bit ago, it's Johnny from Realtree. We're, there, you guys are putting a really cool thing together on the main stage there, and you're doing some seminars. And uh, I'll actually be there. Hopefully, Dennis will be able to make it, but I will definitely be there. And we're going to do actually uh, spend some time talking uh, to your guests there about – some of the some of the important aspects of hunting waterfowl on public land. So I'm looking very forward to that. I think we'll do that on two different days through two different time slots. I'm sure you guys will put out a schedule of events and so forth, but I'm very excited about that opportunity. So I'm sure there'll be some photo op time yeah. there as well. Yeah, there's going to be three stages at the Expo. One of them is the Delta Waterfowl stage, and so we'll talk about Delta things or – Predator management program, our university hunting program, research, different things like that. And then there will be the duck hunter stage, which you're talking about. And then there'll be the, the, the I believe it's the dog stage. So talking a lot okay. about dog training and things like that. So it's going to be gonna be pretty interesting to come and, and learn about that. You know, we spent so much time talking. I, I, I'm i going to have to kind of push us through maybe the, the final stage Sorry here and, and just get back on a different one to talk more about it so i think in closing as we kind of wrap things up give us top two public land hunting tips from for a a novice someone who's like i'd like to get into hunting i don't own land i don't have family land i don't have money to you know purchase a lease what top two tips for public land hunting yeah i appreciate that that that's good i i think um and it's not rehearsed, so you're gonna get you're gonna get you're gonna get first thoughts out of Billy here. Yeah, that's scary. Um, I, I do think, and and it's a difficult one because a lot of times when people are first getting into waterfowl hunting, they they want to go hunting. Um, our our slogan, if you will, uh, our focus has been the journey. It's always about the journey. Part of that journey for us is the homework that goes in. And I I think my top tip would, would boil down to scouting. You're going to, you're going to learn more about the specific area that you're wanting to hunt in. You're going to learn more about ducks. You know, when it, when it boils down to even duck calling, what's, how do I learn to blow a duck call? Well, the best way to learn to blow a duck call is listen to real ducks. 
you spend your time out scouting, guess what? You're probably going to come up on some real ducks. So just not only where I can shoot ducks tomorrow comes from scouting, but understanding how I will get to point A, from point A to point B in a competitive situation safely, what tools I will need when I'm there, what my decoy spread's going to look like, what the ducks sound like in that area that I'm hunting. All of that can be picked up from putting time in to go scouting. And, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, I'm gonna hunt Arkansas for the first time, I only got three days, how can I be successful? Well, my answer first is gonna be probably pay a guide. Yeah. Anytime we go to a new area like that, there really is a couple of days of homework that has to go in. And you will be so much more thankful if you put that work in, not only is it going to mean more if you find success to know that you put that work in to do that on your own, but there's just so much that you can learn about waterfowl hunting in general. Uh, that would probably be my number one tip. Number two, in all honesty, there's so many little things that can go into it, but it gets back to that experience. And, and I, I hate to harp on it, but really the good Lord laid it out pretty well for us on, on how we're supposed to act and treat each other. And, and just like you said, treating other people in those situations, the way we would want to be treated when you're hunting public land, it's not like climbing in that deer blind or going to hunt private with the guys who, you know, are going to be there that you're going to run into a lot of other people. And I'm not telling you, you have to take them hunting, but the way you treat those people, the way you engage with those people, the amount of respect you show to those people. I, I've, uh, I've seen some bad things happen to some, some kids who were just trying to get out and experience hunting for themselves on their own for some first times. And they've run into some pretty older hardcore guys that weren't very friendly for them. And it, it made a, it created an experience where they didn't really want to come back. And, and that's not something we need. And it, it starts with you and me. And so I guess as you know, it might not revolve around actual waterfowl shooting, but when we're out there, it, my second tip would be, we, we really need to handle ourselves, act a certain way and really treat everyone around us with a little, little more respect than, than, uh, you know, if that makes sense. It does make a lot of sense. There, I have this quiet movement <clears throat> that I'm working on, and it's not deltas, but but it's, you know, I think trophy. You know, if you think trophy, you know, you tend to think giant deer, giant elk, you know, full limits of mallards. That tends to be trophy, the picture that and, – and, and for me, when I talk with my friends in my close circle and my kids, I talk about trophy experiences. And a, and a trophy experience – you may not have harvested anything, but That's if you right. had a trophy experience, it means you appreciated all aspects. You didn't take it for granted. You noticed the sunrise. You noticed other things out there. You cherished your friends. You cherished the dog. You, you know, and if you were fortunate enough to harvest it, sure, that's part of the trophy experience. But, but I, I'd like to see people redefine trophy because I do think, and that's why I want to linger one last time on. Yeah, on your shows, on your podcast, you're talking about, you know, all the success you had, but you're also showing your failures. I think that's really important because I think if someone is introduced to hunting through TV um, or Netflix or something like that, there it creates an expectation that I don't think most people can live up to. And so I think you're going to be let down. So if a trophy experience is just enjoying it, and whether that includes, you know, harvesting or not, um, seek trophy experiences and celebrate those and that's and part of that billy is being nice to people being accommodating again don't have to invite them to your spot but be encouraging be nice you know be a good steward for hunting so congrats to you guys i, I appreciate it well no i appreciate your insight and and I, I i enjoy so much hearing others especially in the positions like like you're in talk about those similar things that I do think that it's becoming more top of mind awareness nowadays. Uh, and I, again, it gets back to the kind of world we're living in. And 
I look, it's, it's a small part of us and, and we got to understand we're all on the same team. And, and, uh, I know we all want to kill ducks tomorrow, but, but there's a lot more involved in it than that trophy. Just like you said, you're right. Well, I think you did a great job. I'm going to use that. Adv- that's my advice now. Scout and be nice. So we'll go with that. <laughs> the rest will come along with it. That's Billy, right. I, Billy, I appreciate it. I, I really do. Um, it was We kind of took a sip from a fire hose. We covered a lot of ground. We'll have to break this up with, a, with another one. We'll zoom in on a certain aspect. Maybe there's some aspect of Delta that you're interested in, or maybe you feel like there's a part of Dr. Doc that – that you'd like to share, you know, with others, but we'll get you back on. We'll see if we can get Dennis to join you at the same time. If not, I, if not, I'll do another one with you, Billy. That was, uh, I enjoyed our time together in the chat and no, that. no shortage of things to talk about. Thank you very much for that, Joe. And again, it's a blessing to, to have this opportunity. So I, I appreciate it very much. Well, me too. Well, let me just, in closing, if you want to see the merchandise, the gear, you know, the functional gear, drduck.com. From that uh, website, you'll see the podcast button if you want to listen to Dennis and, and Billy and guests talk about waterfowl hunting. I think you have a turkey hunting episode on there right now. But if you want to learn about hunting, uh, give that a listen. If you want to watch these guys on Federal Premium's Black Cloud, go to realtree365.com. You can find it there. Three seasons, the most recent being about 20 episode so yeah give them a look give them a listen and uh billy i appreciate it we'll wrap it up right here and and uh stay in touch and keep up the good work yes sir thank you so much joe you bet take care billy